Revelation chapter 17 and 18 concerns the very end. The remainder of Revelation is dominated by two female figures, one a filthy prostitute and the other a pure bride. Neither is a person. Both are personifications. They represent cities. The title, A Tale of Two Cities, could be used. Babylon and Jerusalem, the city of man, and the city of God are their names. We will look at the former. Revelation 14.8 NIV A second angel followed and said, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Revelation 16.19 the great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the Great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. In the Bible, cities are often seen as wicked places. The initial reference, which is usually crucial, links them to Lamech's line of weaponry and the production of mass destructive weapons. They concentrate people and hence sinners and thus sin. Vice and crime thrive in an environment where there is less community and more anonymity. Greed and pride are the two sins that are highlighted in this passage. Both are linked to money's idolatry, because it is impossible to worship both God and Mammon at the same time. Luke 16.13 No servant can be the slave of two masters. Such a servant will hate one and love the other, or will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In an affluent city, it is easier to forget the Creator of heaven and earth. Self-made men worship their own Creator. Buildings that are frequently memorials to human ambition and achievement, which demonstrates arrogance. Such was the Tower of Babel by the Euphrates River, sitting on the route between Asia, Africa, and Europe. It was founded on the concept that might is right, that the fittest survive by Nimrod, the powerful hunter of animals and warrior among men. The tower was supposed to be the tallest man-made building, as a powerful statement to both men and God. They expressed intention to make a name for themselves. Genesis 11.4 NIV Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves, Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. God judged this presumption by granting its inhabitants the gift of tongues, but the simultaneous removal of their common speech brought unintelligible bedlam, from which we derive the verb babble. Note that at Pentecost this did not happen, for the same gift brought unity. Acts 2.44 All the believers were together and had everything in common. When Nebuchadnezzar, a brutal tyrant who slaughtered babies, animals, and even trees when conquering new territory, this city became the seat of a great and strong kingdom. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you, and the plunder of beasts which made them afraid, because of men's blood, and the violence of the land and the city, and of all who dwell in it. In the meantime, Israel's King David had built Jerusalem as his capital. It was not, however, in a strategic location for trade because it was not near the sea, a large river, or a significant road. It was, nevertheless, the city of God, the site where he chose to live among his people, at first in the tent Moses assembled, later in the temple Solomon built. The greatest threat to Jerusalem was Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar eventually demolished the holy city, including its temple, removing its wealth and sending its people into exile for 70 years. Because the residents had made it an unholy city like all the others, God allowed it to happen. But this was a momentary chastisement, not a permanent punishment. Through the prophets, God promised both recovery of Jerusalem and the ruin of Babylon. For example, Jeremiah 51, 6 through 9, NKJV. Flee from the midst of Babylon, and everyone save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore the nations are deranged. Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed. Wail for her. Take balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. 
Forsake her, and let us go every one to his own country. For her judgment reaches to heaven, and is lifted up to the skies. Jeremiah 51, 45-48 Come out of her, my people, run for your lives. Run from the fierce anger of the Lord. Do not lose heart, or be afraid, when rumors are heard in the land. One rumor comes this year, another the next. Rumors of violence in the land, and of ruler against ruler. For the time will surely come when I will punish the idols of Babylon. Her whole land will be disgraced, and her slain will all lie fallen within her. Then heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon. Isaiah 13, 19-20, KJV And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. As predicted, that horrible city deteriorated into a dismal heap of debris, completely deserted except by desert wild animals. The fact that the book of Daniel and Revelation have so many parallels is no coincidence. Both books contain end-of-the-world visions that are very similar. However, Daniel received the revelations during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. He had been a young man in the first of three deportations. He had seen the future trajectory of world empires up to and beyond the time of Christ, to the very end of history, the reign of Antichrist, the millennial rule, the resurrection of the dead, and the day of judgment. The Babylon described in the book of Revelation is definitely going to be a commercial hub, a place where people can get and spend money. Notice how traders are affected by its demise. Revelation 18, 11-16, ESV And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is, human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud, alas, Alas for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. Culture is not going to be overlooked. Note the music in Revelation 18.22. Revelation 18.22 ESV And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters, will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. But it will be corrupt and corrupting, with materialism replacing morality, pleasure replacing purity, wealth replacing wisdom, and lust replacing love. The simile of the harlot is peculiarly appropriate, giving anyone what they want in exchange for money. We've only looked at the lady, but she rides a beast, which has seven heads and ten horns, plainly representing a political union. We are not told who they are, nor are we given many details about them. They are powerful men, yet they don't have any land to rule over. Their power comes from the beast, presumably the Antichrist, to whom they will pledge complete devotion. Above all, they'll be openly anti-Christian, declaring war on the Lamb, 1714, and those with him, presumably because their consciences will be pricked. Revelation 1714, NIV They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them, because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. But Babylon is doomed. She and they will fall. Their days will be numbered. The incredible manner in which this is accomplished is absolutely plausible in today's environment. The situation is not impossible to foresee, given that the majority of the world's business will be in the hands of 300 megacorporations. Ambitious politicians, hungry for power, resent this financial clout. They are even prepared to bring about economic disaster if that will enable them to take over. 